Innovation has basically two sides. It has creativity and it has efficiency. Okay? And almost everything we do, especially in businesses, even in education, actually focuses on one side of the equation. It focuses on efficiency. Right? Trying to get more for less. Focus on answers. In schools, we don't teach children how to ask questions. We don't even teach them what a good question is. We teach them how to follow recipes. Right? We teach them to be efficient because that's how our organizations run. The problem is that the world changes. Okay? To be efficient is a really good idea if your world is constantly static. And in biology, the best environment for efficiency is competition. Okay? But in a world that changes, you have to adapt. In fact, the most successful systems in nature are the most adaptable. They're not the most efficient. Right? To give you an example, in 2010, the top 10 in-demand jobs didn't actually exist in 2004. It's not that they became more popular. They weren't even there. We had no idea what they were going to be. So imagine what's going to happen in just the next 10 years. Right? So we're educating kids now, for instance, for a world that doesn't even exist. They're going to have 8 to 10 different careers through their lifetime. Okay? So the future focus is not to bias everything towards creativity. Because if a bus is coming at you, you don't want to think, oh, I wonder if there's a different way I can see this. Right? You want to get out of the way as fast as possible. Wisdom is being at the edge of chaos on average. It's moving back and forth across. But today we're going to focus mainly on creativity. So what is at the heart of creativity? And it's perception. Why perception? Because perception underpins everything you know, you believe, the clothes you wear, the people you fall in love with. Everything begins with perception. So to understand perception is to not only understand the brain, it's to understand what it is to be human. So we're going to talk about perception. And in thinking about it, I have one aim. It's the same aim I have in every single talk, which is I want you to know less at the end than you think you know now. <laughs> All right? And I always succeed, no matter how well I do. OK, why? Because nothing interesting begins with knowing. Anything interesting begins with doubt. It begins with not knowing. Right? And I want you to doubt at the most fundamental level, even your level of the perception of reality. Which means that when it comes to creativity, it isn't this chaotic, messy, serendipitous, mysterious process. Because we never bring things together that are far apart. Right? It only appears that way when other people do it. Which means cr there's nothing creative about creativity. Right? It's only creative from the outside. When someone you see pulling two things that are far apart together, for them, they sit right next to each other. It's just that their space of possibility is different. Because their assumptions, their biases, their history is different. For them, they're just taking small steps. They're just changing their space of possibility around them by the questions they ask. Okay? So if this is the case, what makes creativity difficult? And there are four things, in fact. I'm only going to talk about one of them. But the first one is we walk through life thinking we have an objective view of the world. And if you walk away with anything, walk away with the fact that everything you're doing now is grounded in your assumptions, your biases. Right? You do not have an objective view of the world. Which isn't to say your view of the world is wrong, it's useful. Okay? The second thing is almost everything we do, we have no idea why we do it. Which is why questionnaires and marketing don't work. Right? People give you aspirational answers. They don't know why we do what we do. But you put it on a polygraph, and I'm going to give you an answer, and I'm going to believe it. Okay? But the main reason is that we hate not knowing. Uncertainty is an awful thing for your brain. If you're not sure that was a predator, it's too late. Your brain evolved to take what is uncertain and make it certain. Seasickness is a consequence of uncertainty. When you go down below in a boat, and your eyes are moving the register of the boat, and your eyes are saying, oh, we're standing still. But your inner ears are saying, no, 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 we're moving. Right? And you get ill. Your brain cannot deal with that conflict. Which is why if you go above deck, look at the horizon. And your eyes and inner ears are now moving in register. Okay? So we literally hate uncertainty. In fact, it's pathological to seek uncertainty. If everything was fine during evolution, you had your food, you had your shelter, what a stupid idea to go and see what's on the other side of that hill. Right? Because there are more ways of dying than there are staying alive. And the irony is that that's the only place we can go 
if we're going to do something new, is to step into uncertainty. So, because to not know was to die. So, fortunately, evolution gave us a solution. What is the one human behavior, in fact, it's not just human, where uncertainty is not just tolerated, it's sought. We actually love uncertainty in this context. It's play. Play actually evolved as a solution to uncertainty. Play is not just an activity. It's actually a way of being. It's a way of being that's defined by celebrating uncertainty, right? To not know the punchline of a joke is what makes it funny. To not know who's going to win is why the game is fun. We seek uncertainty in play, right? It encourages diversity. And this is, in fact, how we create diversity. And diversity is the engine of change. It's open to possibility. In fact, it creates our possibility. It's inherently cooperative, and it's intrinsically motivated. Almost everything we do in the world, we do for something else. I do A in order to gain B. The reward for play is play. Why are people out there skiing? What's the value of that? The reward of skiing is skiing, right? It's intrinsically motivated, right? It's the driver for curiosity. So, and we're not the only ones who play. The most adaptable systems in nature are the ones that play into adulthood. There's no intrinsic value in these rings other than to make them. If we add intention to play, we get science. Science is nothing other than play with intention. Science is a way of being. It's not defined by its methodology. That's the craft of science, right? But science, true science, is a way of being. And if you, when we apply this in schools, we've created a whole education program where science in schools, and it resulted in the youngest published scientists in the world at age eight to 10 years old, right? And the youngest main stage TED speaker, who was Amy here, okay? And we're not doing this in order to create little scientists. We're doing this in order to enable, to teach these children how to step into uncertainty, which they can then apply in anything in their lives. So in fact, we're working now to create the world's first science institute that is just for young girls from the most deprived areas in Santiago, Chile. So what this means is that in order to be creative, the environment, the ecology of creativity is fundamental. And key to that is the leader the teacher, the head teacher, the leadership of a company, of a lab. And if you ask people what defines a good leader, you get all these descriptions, right? All of them make sense, but there are only three that are associated with the success of any one company. Lead by example, admit mistakes, and see quality in others. Why these three? The first one, because play does not happen outside a space that's trusted, right? Lead by example creates a secure, trusted space. The second is admit mistakes. That's a space that celebrates uncertainty. And thirdly, see qualities in others. That's a space that's open to diversity. So these three aspects of leadership are actually directly tied to creativity. And in particular, this way of being that enables. So the next greatest innovation is not going to be a technology. It's a way of being that will enable technologies and other adaptations. Which means, what defines a good leader is how you lead others into uncertainty. So we'll just finish with two videos showing you examples of leadership. Here's one. Lead by example, supportive, trusting, right? That's one. Here's the other, right? Looks up for reassurance. Yes. <laughs> so what kind of leader are you? And the point is you have to be both because it's being at the edge of chaos on average.